One of the most famous examples of cross-cutting comes from this sequence in The Godfather. As Michael Corleone is attending the baptism of his child, he is at the same time executing a baptism of violence on his enemies. There's a thematic element at play here, motivating this cutting back and forth. But the basic understanding of this sequence is that these events are all happening simultaneously. But how do we know these things are happening at the same time? There's no shot of a clock to let us know that, hey, these things are happening at the exact same time. It's simply understood. Well, that's because through editing, film communicates a certain language that an audience intuitively understands. There's a certain logic to how we combine shots, similar to the logic to how we combine words to make sentences. This manipulation of time and space is really what marks film unique from other media. The language that it speaks is its own. Now we have a close-up, then we show what he sees. Now we cut back, and he smiles. Now what is he as a character? He's a kindly man. Now we'll put in a piece of film of a girl in a bikini. What is he now? The dirty old man. That's what film can do for you. But it wasn't always a given that the audience would understand this language. Someone had to figure it out. As much as Georges Méliès pushed filmmaking and created a world of special effects and popularized narrative storytelling in cinema, his films do lack the sophistication of storytelling as we know in movies today. Méliès' films are fantastical and imaginative, but the filmmaking is still very primitive. The camera is almost always locked off and at a distance, as if we're watching a stage production. And part of what's going to put Milius out of fashion is not just the First World War, but the sophistication with which films will advance in just the next year. In 1903, just one year after A Trip to the Moon, Edwin S. Porter makes two films that will collectively change movie making forever. Porter was a projectionist and filmmaker who had worked under Thomas Edison. It's also noted that Porter shot this snuff film of an elephant being electrocuted for Thomas Edison. And I cannot wait to stop talking about Thomas Edison. <laughs> but it's important to note that this is still what Edison's about. He's uninterested in narrative, just interested in making exploitive one-shot movies that are just meant to shock and horrify. Porter was strongly affected by A Trip to the Moon, which he helped make legal copies of for Thomas Edison. He, however, first did some experimenting. His first try at this was Life of an American Fireman, a short film that shows firemen rushing to put out a fire and the frantic woman trapped inside. What Porter did first was show us the events as they play out inside the burning building. The woman and child are trapped, then rescued by firemen. But then the movie goes backward in time and shows us these events again from the fireman's perspective. It was initially thought that if these events played out together, cross-cutting back and forth, the audience would be confused. So I am confusion. But the realization of intercutting would find its foothold in Porter's most famous film, The Great Train Robbery. A 12-minute western that would truly kickstart films as an entertainment juggernaut. The story of a group of bandits robbing a train, tying up the conductor, dramatically shooting a man and being chased by the law, combined and popularized conventions of movies that are still seen today. It has a bold and memorable first shot, breaking the fourth wall with an outlaw firing his gun into the camera. And the camera doesn't just present things like a play. At one point we're on the train moving along with it. We have this bold composition with characters moving from the background to the foreground, almost as if this guy is trying to escape from the movie. And all of this shot on location, which adds to its realism. At one point, the camera pans to the left, which reveals new information for the audience, allowing the filmmaking to take part in telling the story. And then our most innovative move. Porter cuts back to the train conductor as he is untied and runs to alert the lawman of the robbery. The audience instinctively knows that this is the next logical scene to see that by cutting back to the conductor tied up, we're not going back in time. Ultimately, what Porter discovered here is that scenes don't need to be played out. 
You can cut away from scenes or shots, and the audience will naturally understand that even though the space has changed, time hasn't. Audiences probably didn't think about this too hard, but it's obvious that these elements contributed to the movie's excitement and made it much more of an engaging film to watch. The Great Train Robbery was so popular that it was copied and widely distributed, helping jumpstart many theaters and Nickelodeons. It really cemented movies as a bona fide money-making venture. It's also the film that encouraged four brothers, with the last name Warner, to open a theater just to show the film. These were the these were the Warner Brothers, by the way, in case that wasn't that wasn't clear. The same year, you can also see a similar use of deep space photography in what is believed to be the first film version of Alice in Wonderland. This film combines Porter's use of staging with Milius-like camera tricks and costumes. In 1903, movies are also getting longer. This adaptation of The Life of Christ from France and produced at the Pathé Brothers studio is 45 minutes long, and its overall large scale foreshadows the rise of epic movies that we'll see eventually come out of Italy. These early days of cinema have a playful spirit of innovation where any trick of the camera can be used for dramatic effect. This double exposed piece of film titled Ghost Train feels pretty similar to the kind of stuff I would do just for fun the first time I bought a camera. A seemingly unremarkable comedy film from 1903, A Chess Dispute, is notable, however, I think, for how it handles comedy. When two men playing chess get into a fight, they both fall below camera. Instead of panning down to show the fight, the comedy comes from not seeing it. Just holding and seeing the men's clothes and limbs fly up briefly into frame. The humor is in the staging rather than what's actually happening. 1903 was a very important year for cinema. Some studios like Pathé and Gaumont are being established, which will become major players in early French production. And with the success of The Great Train Robbery, movie theaters become a booming business venture. Many of these theater owners will transition into movie moguls. But much like The Great Train Robbery, the early film business had a Wild West mentality, which led to films being copied with a complete disregard for copyrights. In the case of Porter, he probably could have become an even more dynamic filmmaker if every dime spent on The Great Train Robbery had gone straight to him. But then of course you have hypocrites like Thomas Edison, who for a while tries to sue anyone who even makes a film, since of course he was the inventor of cinema. But that only encourages filmmakers to head west, away from Thomas Edison in New Jersey, and many of them will set up studios in an area perfectly suited for making movies. Hey guys, thanks again for watching. Uh, there's a new a Journey Through Cinema video about once a month. I'm having a great time making these videos. I would love to make them more often. One way that you can help support me is if you subscribe to my channel and like this video. You can leave a comment down below letting me know what subject or year you're looking forward to me eventually talking about on this channel. Hopefully I'll be able to start making these more often. That way I'm not, you know, covering the 70s in 2049. But even if it takes me that long, you know, it'll be worth it because I just, I just love talking about cinema history. So looking forward to getting there one day. Okay, I'm gonna go turn my air conditioning back on because it is a million degrees outside. <laughs>